the the one stat that, that that we keep hearing is you know when you fly commercially you may hit 700 points of contact during your trip yep. and with uh flying privately they'll tell you it may be 20 or 30. i'll, yep. I'll tell you having done it recently you may, i may have run into four or five people yeah. you know through the trip so you're drastically reducing just the amount of contact you're having with with a, you know a ton of individuals Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Powers, and I want to thank you for joining me on the Fort Podcast today. This show is an open-ended discussion and journey covering real estate, business, entrepreneurship, and investing. I would love to hear from you by tweeting me at Fort Worth Chris on Twitter. Hey, guys, it's Chris. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Fort I have John Owen with me today, the CEO of Airshare, which is a private aviation business offering fractional ownership, a jet card, aircraft management, maintenance, and charter services. We have a really cool conversation today about Airshare and the private air business, how it works. We talk a lot about kind of some of the misnomers and things that people don't necessarily think about when they think of private air. Uh, We talk about the industry in general. Aviation throughout COVID has had a spotlight put on it and what they're seeing in private air travel. I won't spoil it, but there's positive uh, momentum in private air as a lot of people are opting to fly private rather than fly commercial. We talk about kind of the industry as a whole and what the next 10 years might look like. We talk about kind of technology and things that are happening in aviation to make flying more affordable and safer. Um, And we talk about John's story and how he became the CEO of this great business, Airshare. So thank you so much for continuing to join me on this journey, and I hope you enjoy. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming to Fort Worth today. Absolutely. Can we just start with kind of your story growing up and what led you to Airshare and where you are today? Yeah, well, it's it's not too short of a story. Uh, I've done quite a few things. Grew up in Kansas City, born and raised there whole, my whole life. Uh, high school there, went to college at University of Kansas, which was not too far away. Um, and then from there, you know, I graduated and I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I literally took the first job I was offered, which was for a mutual fund company. And it was one of those jobs where it was, you got in at, you know, 738 that day, you did the exact same thing all day long, check out at 435, and then you got right back on the hamster wheel the yep. next day. And so <laughs> I quickly realized that that was not what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, to my parents' unliking, I uh, decided to quit and go backpack in Europe for a month. <laughs> <laughs> Find yourself. Right. Yeah. And so, okay, I, I know I don't want to do this. I don't know what I want to do. So you know, let's take some time and, and did that, came back and then kind of focused my efforts on, on finding something I really wanted to do. Ended up at a big IT consulting firm for a few years. Had always really wanted to be, get in the finance side of things. And then, so I started taking some classes to get my uh, master's in accounting and CPA, ended up doing that full time, then go into a, a big accounting firm after that and did that for a few years. And then really wanted to kind of, again, migrate into that into that finance type role, left KPMG and then uh, joined a couple other guys in a consulting firm where we were just doing a lot of projects here and there. Um, And that was really, I'd I'd always been in kind of big businesses up until that point and was doing those consulting roles right in the time of, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the great recession period. And so, so the, the big jobs were kind of drying up decided that, you know what, maybe we should focus on some of these smaller businesses, middle market companies to kind of help them through this and really kind of fell in love with that space, uh, with, with those particular projects. And so did a lot of that. And, and from there, ended up taking a CFO role at a, at a small kind of mid-market trucking company back in Kansas City and, and, and really enjoyed it. Ended up with a lot of the operational type responsibilities underneath me as well. And then so that kind of Ran me off this interesting path of uh, went and worked for a little small investment bank in Kansas City, and then from there got recruited over to do uh, executive search consulting, and then so did that for a short period of time, and 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 really enjoyed that because you know I through all that I figured out that I really love the organizational aspect of businesses, and so once I was there, you know, just doing that, doing that role and, and helping people were calling for, you know, CFO or CEO roles, or, you know, whatever, whatever they needed. 
and Airshare happened to be somebody that called in and said, hey, uh, we're looking for a new CFO. <laughs> and so, you know, we sat down with them and, and, and after talking with them for about an hour, the person uh, from from our firm that I was with kind of said, "Hey, the, the, you know this space. They've basically explained your background. Yep. <laughs> and will you, you know, is this something you would want to do?" And and I was like, "Ah, you know, I, I don't know. It's uh, uh, you know, I've, I've done the family office, the family business thing before, and it was kind of a similar situation. But then ended up running into the current ownership group. They were amazing." The business, you know, really felt like we use this term all the time, a sleeping giant. Yep. Customers loved it. The team that was there was really good. There's a lot of tenure. You know, it's been around for 20 years now. There's there's people that have been there since day one. Yep. And just just felt like a, a really good opportunity. So ended up taking that CFO role. And then about a year, year and a half later, ended up in uh, the present CEO role. So two things. What were you doing in the consulting world? Like just you'd you'd dive into a project for three or four months. Yeah, would hire you. And yep. what was like a typical job? What were they wanting from y'all? It was a, a lot of it came from the accounting firm that we worked from. So KPMG would go into audit audit certain places and said, hey, you know these guys need help cleaning whatever up their you know their financial package, whatever it is. So we would we would go in and, and really help them streamline consolidations and kind of help them out with that kind of stuff. And then you said you really like kind of the organizational operational piece of the business. Yeah. Like, what does that mean to you? I, I kind of figured out that through that process, I like numbers. I've always been a numbers guy, but I ended up liking more about what the numbers told you. Yeah. So kind of taking, hey, you know, you know, I started from the accounting side of things. Didn't really like that because that, that just felt like you were just putting numbers in the right spot. And then so migrated over to the finance side of the house, which is more, you know, taking what accounting has done and trying to figure out what that says and then using that for, you know, to improve efficiencies and operations or maintenance or wherever that kind of kind of led. So, Got it. Yep. All right. So you landed Airshare, your CFO for a year, year and a half, and then migrate into the CEO role. Uh, was there something that I guess did the previous CEO step down or you worked in your like, how, how did you take that role so quick? Yeah, he uh, he ended up resigning from the company, and then so at that point in time, they put me in in that role on an interim basis, and then about I don't know, probably two or three months later, kind of you know finally anointed me in the role. Yeah. Yep. And y'all don't have a CFO right now, do you? Uh, we don't. We've just hired a, a, another director of finance. Yep. Uh, we have a we have a vice president of accounting and and administration that really between you know my role there and what I know of the business and 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 those people it kind of works well. So I'm excited to talk about today just private air, and uh, we've had a couple other guests that are more on the aerospace manufacturing side, but aviation's certainly a, a hot button right now in the world we're living in. So we'll get into a little bit more about what's going on in private air, but before, like, how would you describe AirShare? What do y'all do? We kind of feel like we're a one-stop shop. Okay. There's a lot of people out there that they may manage airplanes, they may provide charter, they may do fractional services, they may do third-party maintenance. You know, some of them may do a couple of them, but really we we do all of them and 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 almost always have. Like yeah. the, AirShare for a long, long time was known as a fractional company. Right. Well, we had two separate businesses that really worked autonomously from one another and and, you know, that was one of the, the things that we did two or three years ago when I took over is felt like these services are all extremely complimentary. Yep. And sometimes the customer will come to us or a prospect will come to us and, and not really know what they want. Yep. And they think, hey, you know, I want to buy an airplane. We're like, well, how much do you, are you actually going to use it? What are you going to use it for? And we'll tell them, you know, based on that, economically speaking anyway, you're better off in a fraction. If you want to own your own airplane, fine. Well, you know, we can do that too. And, and, and we'll, work, we'll work through those, those numbers with you. But you know, or people that come and do a fraction, but don't really need a fraction because they don't utilize it enough to make it uh, economically feasible. So they will we'll tell them, hey, maybe you need a jet carter, maybe you need to do charter. And, and we have a lot of customers that that even, you know, migrate in between all of them. Right? Yep. We, we've got a, a recent customer who bought a jet card a couple of years ago, and then just started flying like crazy. His business started started really, really growing. He ended up buying an airplane that we managed, keeping his jet card. They've since bought a second airplane that we manage, still have their jet card. So we have we have a lot of customers, you know, not necessarily like that, but that do start in, you know, kind of a try before you buy mode. Right. And then work their way up from a jet card to a fraction to whole aircraft ownership or 
somebody they may know on the on an airplane and decide, you know what, I don't need this anymore, but I still want access to it to a private jet, you know, migrate down to the fraction. So if I come in and I'm I'm stuck between a jet card and fractional ownership, like what what sways somebody in either direction? Like describe the jet card a little bit. What what do you get in there? Sure. So one of the differences between AirShare and everybody else is we sell days. Everybody usually thinks about jet cards and fractions and, and buckets of hours. Okay. Uh, we actually don't limit hours. We sell you a number of days. So uh, for our fractional purposes, they start at 20 days. So okay. if you can utilize somewhere around 20 days a year, you, you can fly one hour or 10 hours that day. We don't care then that's when that starts to make more sense. If all you're going to fly, you know, you're going to take three or four trips a year, you know, maybe use, I don't know, you know, 10 hours 20 or 25 hours to 10 days, then that's when the the economics of the cards start to make a lot more sense. So it's really, you know, whether you're in charter, jet cards, fractional or whole aircraft ownership, we'll tell you it's what makes the most sense is about how much you use it. Yep. Yep. And on the fractional side, it often comes with there's tax advantages to owning a fractional share of a business. Is that does that change depending on the administration or like what are some of the advantages to fractional ownership? That, that, that's that's one big advantage. So it's you know right now you get 100 percent bonus depreciation if you qualify for either a new share or a or a share in a newer airplane or a share in an older airplane. Like the older airplane stuff is is newer and what happens at the in you know whatever administration comes in, who knows? Yeah. But, we hope that there's that you know some continued tax advantages of buying into that share, but so I if I know. buy like a fraction for a couple hundred grand, I can basically write all that down in the year that I acquired that fraction. Yep. If you if used for business, yep, yep. And then going forward, my annual cost to fly is still a tax deductible, assuming it's for business yep. travel. Uh, yeah, you'll pay a monthly management fee each month, which pays for your pro rata share of pilots and hangar and insurance. You know all the overhead costs. And then you pay your hourly rate as you fly, which covers things like fuel. And so if you own the fractional ownership, what is the ongoing cost once you've purchased your fraction of the plane, assuming like you bought 30 days? Yep. We'll do a typical fraction is is 20 days. Uh, we fly two airplanes fractionally, a Phenom 100 and 300. One's essentially a smaller version of the other. One yeah. has four seats. The other has about eight seats. And the Phenom 300 your monthly management fee is going to be in the eight to nine thousand dollar range, okay. and then your hourly rates going to be anywhere between two and three thousand dollars an hour. So, so that's one of the distinct advantages that that we have with AirShare is, and why we ended up track, attracting a lot of businesses is we have what we call an express rate. So, okay. if you, you know, everybody's typical rate in a Phenom three hundred is going to be in that three thousand to thirty some hundred dollar range. We'll tell our customers, and it's written in the contract that if you fly out to a location a day and fly back, or maybe it's an overnight, or maybe you've got to hit multiple spots in a in a given day, or you know do a, do a long road show. Since that plane's staying with you the whole time, and we're not having to deadhead that airplane to go do you know go do other trips, we'll give you a thirty five percent discount on your rates. So that now your rates down to the you know two thousand dollars range per hour, which which nobody can touch it for right? sure. Yep, that was or, what I was going to ask you that question if. If somebody's flying out, let's just say for like a week long vacation, they're landing there. You're clearly not having the plane sit idle at that airport. Right. Um, um, I guess unless the customer asked for it, which they'd be paying to have they, it sit idle. They, yeah, they'd be eating through their days as it's sitting there. So do you, how do? And I'm sure you all have software and algorithms, and there's math to it. But if I'm flying, let's just say to Palm Springs, are y'all hoping that there's another customer in Palm Springs needing the jet or if it's if there's not, am I paying for the jet to go fly wherever it's going to pick up the next customer? No, your your hourly rate to get to Palm Springs is all you pay. You pay for the time that you're in there, and and that's got really those deadheads built into it. So yeah. that's why when you're flying with with everybody else, that you know they charge you if you go just one way out, they're fine. But if you go to Colorado and back in a day, they're charging you the three you know thirty two hundred dollars both ways. Where with us, we're charging you two thousand dollars because because within that three thousand dollar hourly cost, it's baked into assuming that they're going to have all this right all this deadhead cost of moving the airplanes. Which with we don't, you're on the airplane, so we give you the discount. Do you have any idea how much? If you said we out of a hundred percent, how much percentage of that of planes flying every year is deadhead? I'd guess probably around 30% or okay. so. Yep. Yeah, that's not bad. How'd y'all choose uh, the Phenom 100 and 300? 
Uh, that was before my time at Airshare, but it was coming out. It was new. It was really superior to a lot of things that were uh, out in the market at that point in time. So we were the first fractional Phenom 300. Uh, well, there's a lot of other fractional companies that fly them now. We were the first ones. The first one to take the Phenom 100 in America. And they're just really good airplanes. You know, Embraer builds their airplanes based on more of a commercial uh, spec. Yeah. And so... You know, they're putting into these these smaller private jet airplanes a lot of the uh, sophistication that they've been building, the ones that you fly on if you're flying a regional commercial jet. So they're very economical, you know, to fly. They're they're very reliable. And, and so we about three years ago, we had accumulated too many different types of airplanes. We, right. we had the Phenom 100s, we had the Phenom 300s, and we had three other types. And, you know, really flying is all about efficiency. Yeah. And so... In order to create that, you know, for safety reasons, we'll only type rate a pilot in two different types of airplanes. Well, when you have five different types of airplanes with six different pilot type ratings, it makes it extremely complicated to move all these airplanes around and kind of build that puzzle. And then so we decided to migrate down to only Phenoms 100 and 300s. It gives our customers a consistent service and it makes yeah. everything efficient and, and allows us to keep our costs down. You had mentioned, you just talked about pilots. When you get a pilot's license, do you have to get a specific license just to fly a Phenom, or does like one license let you fly multiple types of jets? Nope, you go through a training that specifically type rates you. And, and gotcha. That, yep. So and there's some pilots, I guess, if they're maybe at uh, companies that fly all different types of jets that have like a license for each type of jet that they fly. Yep, yep. Yeah. And that's why we say, hey, we're only, we're only type rate you in two different kinds because you need consistency yeah. In, in that particular, yeah. Jet. So how many jets do you all have? We operate about 50 currently. Okay. So half of those are managed airplanes. So okay. when somebody just provides us an airplane and, and we, you know, we'll provide the pilots, the maintenance, all that good stuff, uh, hangar it and you essentially call when you need it. Yep. And then the other half are in the fractional and jet card program, which is the Phenom 100, 300s. And on the, the, the half that are folks that are just coming to you to manage their personal plane, do they allow you to charter that out or to fly it around or is that... Some do, some don't. It's kind of up to the up to the owner. Yep. So uh, it's really good for both if they do, because if they'll allow us to charter it, because that'll offset some of their costs throughout the year, and then also helps us to generate a little bit more margins. So we'll actually charge you a lower management fee if you allow us to charter it. But it works well. I guess the Phenom three hundred is a bigger one, right? Yep. If if I owned a hundred percent of a Phenom three hundred, what am I looking at? Not including flying it, just owning the thing for a year, assuming kind of a normal fly schedule, what does it cost to maintain one of those every year? Yeah, you're, you're gonna, if you buy a new one, it's going to cost you about 9 or $10 million to buy a new. Okay. Uh, cost per year really depends on how many pilots you want. Right. So you, you, uh, depending on if you want to charter or, or not, you know, say two or three pilots, that's going to be, I don't know, say $300,000 or so a year just for pilots. You know, really probably hourly operating costs somewhere between, I don't know, $1,000, $2,000 an hour, depending on kind of what you're doing. And what are like the most common, I mean, I've, I have had friends that have these maintenance nightmares and it's like all of a sudden they get slapped with like a half a million dollar bill to fix their plane. Uh, what are some of the most common kind of maintenance issues that people run into that they might not expect before they actually buy a plane? I think that's one of the biggest eye openers of owning your own plane and and why a lot of people do choose the fractional route because all that stuff's on us. Yeah. Like, you know, through through your hourly fee that you're paying, you know, portion of that goes for us to, you know, do take care of whatever comes up. And then, you know, some people, it's kind of like, you know, people that fly commercially, some people hardly ever get delayed and some people get delayed all the time, right? Yeah. So it's the uh, same thing on the maintenance side is, is you may go through a, you know, a stretch where the plane's operating well and you don't have any issues and, and then you may get some, some big, some big hits every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Do y'all have like hubs around the country or are you allowed to fly into any airport in the country? Like how are y'all set up around the country? Yeah. So we'll, we, we can fly just about anywhere. Okay. Uh, the way our model operates is, is we've decided to build customer densities in certain locations. So it started in Wichita, Kansas. Kansas City is, is now our headquarters. Between Kansas City and Fort Worth, that makes up probably 70% of our business, okay. about, about half and half. The other 30% is really scattered up through kind of the Chicago, Indy, Louisville area, and down through Oklahoma and South Texas. Uh, we've got 
customer base out in Colorado and then one up in Buffalo, New York. So that's where, you know, our customers are located. But again, they can they can fly anywhere. And we've got facilities in Kansas City, Wichita, Fort Worth, and Buffalo. How, how many customers do you all have? We've got uh, right now probably 200 or so. Okay. Yep. And so for you to get density in any one location, how many customers do you need in that location? It really depends. I think it's, you know, I'd say... 20 to 30, you're starting to build build some density in there okay. to where, you know, you're not moving an airplane there every time to pick them up. Right. Um, and, and then so what, el- what else is nice about that, like places like Fort Worth is you know, the pilots that our customers see live in Fort Worth. Right. So, you know, where our customers are is where our pilots are. Got it. So that's one, one thing that our customers really like about the program is you end up seeing the same pilots over and over and over and over again. So if you're in the program for a little while, you know, everybody's kind of on a first name basis. It really starts to feel like your airplane. We're not airlining pilots all over the place to come pick you up. It's, you know, they they may live down the street from you. Who yep. knows? Yeah. So if I'm in like Seattle, Washington, which is way away from any of your yep. hubs and I want to be a customer, am I just not, you'd probably say you probably should go to another air share we, company. Yep. That yep. Has, we would. Yeah. Yep. And that's because that's how we keep our prices down is, right. is creating that density allows us to to reduce all that deadhead that a lot of other a lot of other programs see and, you know, like I said, kind of helps us keep the cost down. What's kind of the market for a private pilot? Like, what do they make? Is that the biggest expense uh, besides maintenance is paying for your pilots? Yeah, depends on really what you're flying. Yeah. But, you know, they may come in at, you know, if, if they're if they're newer uh, with less experience at the forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollar $60,000 range, and then a pilot can make, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 depending on depending on what they're flying. Do a lot of your pilots, are they coming out of commercial aviation and looking to fly private or they're just going straight into private or mixed well, bag? Uh, we get we get some that have come out of commercial aviation. A lot of our pilots will be have been flight instructors somewhere else. And then so they may be looking to gain enough hours to go to the commercial side. And and so it's kind of like sometimes we end up being their last stop. They, they, they like the program because... Since we do a lot of businesses and we do a lot of those out and back day trips, uh, the you know the pilots benefit from that as well because because sure. they're they're now at home sleeping in their beds versus kind of clocking in and and gone to who knows where for the next seven or eight days. How many how many hours do you need to be a commercial pilot? I don't not, that one I don't know exactly. Okay, probably, you know, a lot, a lot, yeah, <laughs> thousands, yeah. When is it a good time for a business owner to start thinking about private aviation? Like, what are the characteristics of a business that having private aviation makes a ton of sense? No, and, and I think that's where uh, there's a little misnomer about, you know, private. Some people see it as a luxury. Like, our customers and, and us included, corporate-wise, see it as a productivity tool. It's it's not as, you know, it's it's not an expensive, but it's, it's you know, you can get a lot done on the thing. And so if, you know, I'd say growing customers and, and you could do it, you could try it once. You can do a charter flight and say, hey, I got to go up to, you know, some some remote area in North Dakota that's going to take you, you know, a lot, a lot of people will come to us because they may say they go out to California and they got to fly out to California. They've got to find the commercial route that gets you there. Well, then they may have a two-hour drive to where they have to go to. So then they eat the whole next day, driving to their location, having their meeting, driving back. They can't find a flight out that day. So then they're waiting until the next day to fly all the way home. And with AirShare, you you know, you go out three, three and a half hours. You can fly almost probably directly to where you want to go. So, that, you know, the kind of mass says that there's about, you know, 10 times as many airports that a, that a private jet can get into than, than the commercial. So if you take, you know, that one main hub that you know that's in L.A., well, there's, you know, 10 other ones scattered around that area that you can get into. So you become extremely efficient. There's, you know, you're basically working as soon as you get on it. They all have Wi-Fi. So it's, uh, we took a trip, uh, it was probably a few months ago now, but we went from Kansas City, picked somebody up in Dallas, Went to Houston, dropped somebody off, had lunch with a meeting with somebody in, in Houston, got back on, uh, went to Midland, met with somebody in the afternoon, had dinner and flew back to Dallas all in one. And you're not tired. I mean, yeah. it's it's so it's it just I don't know. It's 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 like I said, it's it's not necessarily a luxury. It's a productivity tool. And if you've got to get stuff done, there's there's no other better way to do it. Yeah. I mean, a ton of the people I talk to is like if you look at his productivity and, you know, you can obviously afford to do it, 
uh, the amount of value that's in in the cabin when you're sitting with you know six or eight people you're working with in that little tube yeah. for three or four hours. Like, yeah, it's not very often you get in a spot where I guess you have Wi-Fi, but people aren't checking their phone the whole time. You're you're really kind of yeah, having a, a boardroom great... in the sky is what you hear all the yep. time. Yep. So is there like a time if if there's somebody listening to this that's a numbers guy that would just say like it's time to start flying private or it's just kind of they have to make that decision for themselves? Yeah, we'll, we'll hear a lot of questions about, well, you know, can I really offset my commercial costs flying privately? The answer is almost always no. It's 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 going to be more expensive. It's, you know, no different than maybe a country club yep. where you you know if you if you averaged your price per round playing golf at a country club it's a lot higher than probably just going out and buying it yep. but it's it's a lifestyle and it's and it's a way to be as productive as you can we've got so many customers that have said there's no way they could have grown their business without utilizing airshare because yep. it's just it, you know they just get so much done in a day or over two days and 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 really it's about when you've decided that you know that particular investment is worthwhile. I mean, there's a lot of people where maybe they go to locations that are easy to get into and get out of. And, and right now it's even becoming harder because with the reduction of the number of legs that the airlines are flying, you know, not only, you know, the people, the problems that people were having before to get to, lo- to to different locations has been exacerbated because there's a lot less of those now than there even has been before. For so sure. a lot of it's just being able to get to where you want to go. Yeah. 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 How long do y'all keep a f- uh, plane in the fleet? Our maximum age is is 15, we'll say, but I'm not sure we've ever had one that long. Okay. Our oldest one now is only a 2009, so it's 11 years old. And those are flying how many hours a year? Oh, uh, anywhere from like probably six to 800, eight, 900 hours a year, depending on the airplane. And then when it's time to rotate something out of the fleet, you're just selling it into the used market. Yep. There's still there's still plenty good for somebody else to yep, go fly. Absolutely. Yeah. Our airplanes are rated to go thirty five thousand hours. By the time we get rid of them, they may have six, seven thousand hours on them. So they got tons of life left on them. And who's your typical buyer on the on the way out? Like an individual or another business or Yeah. Uh, a lot of times people come to like them on the fractional side. And so we've had customers like that one I was talking to you about that that uh, had uh, purchased a jet card, he actually bought one of our airplanes that was for sale because uh, yep. they like the efficiencies of the phenoms. And so if we've got a customer that's looking to, to own their own airplane, you know, that that's a great way to do it because then we can keep it in the fleet. We can manage it. We can, we can operate it and use it uh, as supplemental lift. But then a lot of times, you know, in that particular size of aircraft, you, you've got a lot of owner operators yep. um, that are, you know, maybe looking to migrate up from something that they that they've had now. But we'll sell sell them to a lot of people that are, you know, individuals. So two more kind of questions about kind of the air share in the business, and then we'll kind of get into more of just the industry. But first is uh, how are y'all owned? Are y'all private equity backed, or what's we, like an ownership structure? We're basically family office owned. Okay. Uh, uh, three primary families. One has controlling ownership in it, and, and the other two who don't have been in it since really the beginning. And they're just patient investors. Patient, patient investors, uh, local, very good people. My, you know, the controlling ownership side, my wife actually went to school with one of the daughters. And so, you know, all fully ingrained in kind of the Kansas City, Wichita area. So, yeah, great people. Great to work with. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice, nice little environment. Not always like that. No, no, (laughs) I know. Yeah. Yeah. I got lucky. How do y'all think about growth? Do y'all think about growth from obviously more customers, but is it also kind of customers that kind of grow up in the business that, like you said, might start with a jet card and by the end of it might own half of a plane or like, how do you think about growing over the next five years? Yeah, both. So uh, right now we're seeing a lot of jet cards, which is great. They're all customers that, not say all customers, but a lot of the customers that probably make sense to be in a fraction by the way they're utilizing uh, their jet cards right now. But there's also a lot of people that this is the first time that they've done it. Yep. Uh, we've got, you know, I would call them introductory type planes. I mean, yep. they're smaller jets. They're, uh, you know, less expensive, uh, but they can, you know, take you to the coast, do whatever. But you don't have to make that giant leap into a golf stream or, you know, a large cabin aircraft. It's kind of like, hey, you know, I, I know I don't want to fly commercial anymore or I need the efficiency of a private jet. 
I'd I love to try you guys out, but I've never been in a program like this before. So I'd like to just start with a jet card and we'll see those quite a bit roll in, in, into fractions. And also just, you know, not only kind of that way, but you know, really getting the name out. We, we, we've kind of realized, again, about two or three years ago that, uh, I think I used this earlier, that the business is, is really a sleeping giant. I mean, it's, the customers love us. Our, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with MPS scores, but they're they're off the charts yep. uh, high. Customers, I mean, this is going to, you know, sound like BS, but they, they don't leave. Yeah. They, uh, they leave when they've sold their business or they don't need the airplane anymore, or maybe they've moved out of one of our areas, you know, or unfortunately have passed away. But almost never do we have a customer leave because of service. So now it's more about, you know, I don't know if you've seen, we've, we've done a lot of rebranding lately uh, and, and really trying to get the word out of, of AirShare to where, you know, we're at least top of mind when you're looking to do something. Yep. Because we know that we know that no matter what program you come in, You'll love it and you won't leave. And so we don't, we'll just kind of want to get you in the family. I love it. And don't y'all do like events and stuff where other airshare owners can meet each other? I know y'all do golf trips and yep. stuff like that. Yep. We yeah. do them here and there. One of the things that, that we don't sell is we're not going to spend a whole bunch of money on parties. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause you know, our customers see that as like, well, somebody's paying for that. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and they're like, it's probably me. Yeah. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're not espresso makers on the, on the airplanes. We don't throw these big lavish parties, but we love to interact with our customers. We're yeah. doing a, we're doing an event, uh, down in Houston here. in I think just a couple of weeks or so, uh, with Tom Watson, he's one of our partners and owners, We'll take a bunch of customers to, to, to do that, and, and they love it. But we we typically spend our time and energy and money on customers versus yep. prospects just because, um, you know, those are the ones that have committed to us. Those are the ones that are in the family, and and that's that's the way we like to, you know, spend whatever kind of event dollars that we have. You also have a Kansas City quarterback. Oh, yeah. That flies Some guy named year. Mahomes. Some yeah. Mahomes. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, – He's been great. He came to us, uh, I think we, we started that a couple of years ago, uh, really before he took off. Yeah. We just love the story of, of, of him, his, you know, his family's from Texas. So between, you know, the Kansas City market and the Texas market, he was a great story. And, and so we approached them and, and, and yeah, it, it worked out great. And we've since extended his contract with us and, you know, he's a, he's a paying customer as well. And he uses it a ton and, like you probably have heard, he's about as nice a guy as as you'll meet. Yeah. He's really down to earth, easy going, perfect ambassador for our brand. Yep. Um and so he's 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 been he's been really, really great. Yep. Two questions. If I was part of Airshare and I just said, Hey, I have the the funds and I need to take a, a big group, could I go to y'all and say, Can you charter me a Gulf stream for the day? So yep. you you can you can either pull that out of your fleet or work with another company that might own one and set yep. it all up. That's right. So so if you're a fractional customer and all we have is the Phenom 100s, which are the smaller light jets, but you need something that you know seats 12, 13 people or can take you to Hawaii or you know Europe or wherever that means, we can get you anything you want. Yeah. And so we've got a we've got a charter department as well that can go out and source that. As you said, some of that. Some of that demand, depending on the size and type of aircraft you need, we may have in our in our managed department. If there's customers that 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 want charter on their airplanes, that's the first place we go to because uh, we want to drive business to them and and you know offset their costs and it works well for us. And and then if if we don't have anything available or or what we have in our managed fleet doesn't quite fit that mission, then yeah, we can always go out go off, go off fleet to the to the operators that we work with. And just kind of one question on just kind of competitors. There's a guy up in Omaha named Warren Buffet Buffett <laughs> that owns NetJets. What's the difference between y'all and NetJets? Part of it is is it, it really the program yeah. is, is a big difference. Uh, you know, they fly Phenom 300, we fly Phenom 300. But with ours, we've got you know, kind of that day based model again, which is which is sometimes hard for people to bridge the gap between, hey, I got this hours thing. I I understand it. You know, how does this days based thing work? Well, 
you know, for them, a share is 50 hours. Right. For us, a share is 20 days. Got it. Well, we've got, you know, say they're franchisees. We do a lot of universities that do recruiting with us, maybe construction companies or banks or, you know, certain types of uh, industries that, you know, that are really anybody that may just go out to a customer and, and come back and see them. Well, if you take a day and and it's a two and a half hour flight there and a two and a half hour flight back, and that's a pretty consistent trip you did, you just got five hours times 20 days, you're getting 100 hours out of our program versus 50 hours out of theirs. So it's it's truly a day. So if I go fly one hour for that day, have I wa- wasted a whole day? Or I've just, I still have like, is 20 days times 24 hours? Or how do you think about it? Yeah, so a pilot can't be on on duty any more than 14 hours. Okay. So you're you're limited to duty time. Got it. Uh, but, you know, in certain situations where maybe you got to get somewhere early in the morning and you're going to do a dinner that day, yep. uh, there's rules that allow us to to put them in day rest during the day so you can get kind of the, the, the full usage out of it. Got it. But, yeah, if, you, if all you're going to do is fly at one hour a day, we'll just flat out tell you we're not the program yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. And we look at it as, a, as an on an average basis. So, yeah. If a lot of your trips are, say, three, four hours a day, and then you've got this one trip where you just want to fly and it's an hour, hour and a half, yeah. yeah, it may not be the most efficient use of that day, but over the course of the your program and the 20 hours of usage that year, you know, it all blends in well to where you're still getting well over your 50 hours for got the it. year. All right. Kind of pivoting more into just like the landscape of private aviation, the aerospace industry, covid has shined a light on it. Commercial airlines are reeling right now. But a lot of what I'm hearing is that it's been a benefit for private air in a way. So maybe let's just talk about like kind of going into March, the world's flying high, everything's good. What did those first couple months look like from your view in the business? Oh, yeah. I remember the day. It was March 16th. Yep. When we were all sitting around the the boardroom kind of thinking, "Uh uh-oh, like, well, like what's coming down the pipe? And and then so we did some pretty significant steps early on of cost cutting and we didn't but you know our goal throughout the whole thing was we did not want to lay off a single person right uh we felt like that we've built a very very solid team uh we didn't want to lose anybody and so our goal as of march 16th the number one goal was we don't want to lose any any people yep um so we went into it with that and then Really, you know, April, mid-April was the low. That was about 10% of flight hours in, in, a, in a week. But then ever since that week, it's, you know, slowly climbed up to where we're probably about 75% or so of normal flight hours. Yep. And a lot of that's attributable to a lot of business customers that we have. So yep. leisure-wise, our leisure travel, uh, which makes up about half our business, is over 100% of where it was last year. Wow. So, th- so that's come back really strong. Yep. The business side of the house is you can see those hours slowly tick up month over month, and, and they've and they've increased every month since since mid April. And a lot of the businesses they're not leaving the program; they're just you know you know some of them are just waiting. Oh, I'm getting a little more comfortable. I'm getting a little more comfortable. And so we're now seeing even some international stuff uh, for some of our business customers that have gone down to to Mexico. It's coming back. The business side is just coming back slower than the leisure side is. Are you seeing a shift of people that maybe weren't flying private before, but maybe could have afforded to that are like, do you think there's any permanent shift to more people are going to fly private, at least for the foreseeable future? Yeah, we, we do. And so even though our hours are down, our customer numbers are up. So, so we're, we're gathering more and more customers throughout this, but you know, th- they're not flying out. So we feel like we've got some pent up demand in there yep. of when things, you know, as things, people get more and more comfortable, hopefully there's a vaccine at some point in time and things are open back up. But, you know, I think a lot of people that have, that have flown privately will tell you once they do, they, 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 they don't want it. It's hard to go back. The drug. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Thing. It's yeah. <laughs> Is there anything particular to private air versus commercial as a as a COVID response? Like, what are y'all having to do that you weren't doing before COVID to yeah. make it a safe environment? No, we we're doing a lot of what everybody else is doing. You know, the the pilots all have thermometers; they check their temperatures every day. We're spraying a a viral disinfectant uh, in the airplane uh, that really. You know, the, we we did a lot of research around that. We saw a lot of kind of nasty things getting sprayed in the planes, and so our our concentration was on, hey, let's get something clean, green, safe, 
and then so found a great product that cohesively bonds to you know all the surfaces in the airplane and 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 not only kills it when you when you spray it but continues to kill it for several days several days afterwards and then really just just everything you know mask that we we can think we're masked but yep. uh you know as few touch points as possible the 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 one stat that 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 we keep hearing is you know when you fly commercially you may hit 700 points of contact during your trip yep and with uh flying privately they'll tell you it may be 20 or 30 i'll yep. i'll tell you having done it recently you may, i may have run into four or five people yeah. you know through the trip so you're drastically reducing just the amount of contact you're having with, with a, you know, a ton of individuals. As it relates to like a private airport, are there certain states that are harder to fly into right now than others, or at the private, they're all kind of the same? It's it's opened up quite a bit. That was a big problem early on when when all the various states were shutting down, or you know, if the state wasn't really shut down or making you quarantine when you got there, your state may have may make you quarantine after you've gotten back from a location. Yeah. So. There's a little bit of that, but it's not nearly as bad as it is, as, as, more nearly as strict as it was in the beginning. I think aviation, in a lot of ways, is a leading economic indicator of things that are happening. Like, is there anything that you are watching for as it definitely relates to your business? And, and obviously, you just said like it's picked up week over week since the bottom of April, but is there anything interesting that you get to see from your view of the world that might give people positive hope of? things to come in the coming months? You, you know, what I think we see is just that, you know, with more and more people traveling and more and more people having more contact with people, moving around quite a bit, things have, haven't been that bad. Like it's, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's a bad virus. It does some really nasty things to people. But we still see, you know, as, again, as more and more people get comfortable with flying, you know, people people are are meeting more, and you know, it's and then they're being responsible about it. So, you know, they're wearing masks or they're or they're keeping their distance. But, you know, what I think is positive is just, you know, I I feel like that as we see people fly more and more, it's kind of people getting more and more comfortable with how to really adapt to this whole new thing. And, right. and so it's not like in the beginning where flying just fell off a cliff and and everybody's kind of sitting around going, what's what's going to happen? It's it's like, okay, people are learning how to adapt to this new environment until we kind of get to a situation where there is a vaccine or something. So the vaccine to, for y'all is kind of the silver bullet that you think really opens things up? I mean, I, 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 would, I would think so. For us, it's... You know, again, since you're not really running into that many people, yeah. like, you know, when I first started traveling again for work, you know, my wife was just like, you know, why are you going there? Why? Are you? And I tell her, I was like, I guarantee you, you've run into way more people at the grocery store than I will today, yep. you know, flying to, you know, Dallas or Houston or wherever I may go. Yeah. And then so I felt safer flying on our airplanes, doing what I was doing that day versus walking into Home Depot, yeah. you know, to get some paint. This isn't the the most positive question ever, but I just think it's something interesting given like the Boeing 737 MAX, clearly like the biggest risk in aviation is like a crash. Is it usually pilot error or is it usually mechanical or can you answer that? No, yeah, I would, I'll tell you because you know, I, I didn't get into private aviation until I got to AirShare. So I've yeah. been there about four years or so. And I had that same question when I got in because we had small little uh, piston airplanes that yep. we fly around in, and and I had never been in one of those till, till I got to Airshare. And and again, my wife's just like, "Are you sure you want to get in that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of an adventurous guy anyway, so yeah. so I liked it." And then you know, talking to all the guys that that have been in this our industry forever and have you know thousands of hours, if not tens of thousands of hours, you know, they'll tell you most likely it's it's pilot. Yeah, and so that's why. You know, it's extremely important to know who you're flying with. I mean, that's, you know, we've recently received ISBEO Stage 3 safety rating, which a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's really the pinnacle of, of safety. It, it takes several years. It takes several audits. And there's a lot of people out there that just are flying, you know yep. what I mean? And, and so they don't have the the operations manuals and the set of policies and procedures and standards that, that we live by day to day. And, and the pilots may not be you know, full-time professional pilots uh, with, with a certain amount of hours. So, you know, our guys even that, that are, have been pilots forever say that, you know, that's that's the key, really. You know? How do you sell that? If I'm 
let's say I don't know you and I'm going out to look for the right company to sign up with. And I know there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of these charter services, it's just like a guy in a plane and he just charters that plane out. Yeah. What are some simple questions that the average Joe would know to ask to figure out if they are flying on a good plane with a good pilot? Yeah, I think a lot of it is what's the age of the airplane? How well is it taken care of? Is it a is it a viable operator? I mean, those are those are all kind of hard things to distinguish if you're a you know an inexperienced uh, buyer. But and then we'll tell you, you know, there's there's some primary safety ratings. There's Argus, uh, Isbeo. And Wyvern are probably three of the biggest ones. And, and you know, there's certain levels of those. And, and and we'll tell everybody that you should go out and make sure that whoever you're flying with, you know, is at that level. Because, you know, with, with some charter operators, I mean, there's a lot of great charter operators out yeah. there. But with a lot of them, you know, we'll get some, well, well, you know, I can fly in this plane for only this much. It's like, well, well, who is it? And who are the pilots? And and what's their, what's their training regimen? And you know, you don't know what's going to show up a lot of times. You've said, hey, I want to go from point A to point B, and I've got this many people. And, you know, we've heard people, they'll send them a, you know, a 30-year-old airplane. Yep. And so it's, it's you know, in, in the charter world, you know, freight or anywhere else, there's there's people that do it professionally a lot and, and adhere to certain standards. And there's people sitting in their basement, yep. you know, hey, they'll take the... They'll take your need, and and you've said you'll pay them this much per hour. Well, guess what? They make money off finding the cheapest airplane that they can find that's going to get you there. Yep. And so it's it's really – charter is a very buyer beware kind of market. Yeah, yeah. Yep. One more kind of question on the kind of pilot situation. You often hear, and I don't know if this is the case for, you know, phenoms in private aviation, but technology's gotten – so great that not that these pilots don't do anything, they're clearly flying and um, they're clearly experienced and skilled, but that in a lot of situations like these planes pretty much fly themselves at this point. Yeah. How long has that been kind of a thing? And this, well, one, is that the case? Planes are so good today that they can kind of run on their own? I'd say a lot of it is. And so I'll, I'll joke with the pilots because, you know, they're, they're up there. Uh, like flying, a million flying the airplane, yeah, but you know they'll turn a knob here and do yeah. this. And I was like, well, this looks pretty easy. Like, yeah, sure it does, right? <laughs> Until you got to land it. Yep. Uh, and and uh, no, they're they're very sophisticated, redundant pieces of equipment. Yep. So especially the phenoms that we fly, I mean, they're they're fantastic. Yep. But you still, I mean, it's you know it's nice and easy when it's clear skies and there's no wind and nothing going on, but. Uh, you know, where the experience really comes into play from a pilot perspective is when, you know, you, you hit those situations where you got to know what you're doing. Yep. Um, so it, it does make a big difference The you know, the the airplanes are getting a lot more sophisticated. You know, there's there's technology coming out where, you know, the, the, the airplanes will land themselves. It's kind of like the driverless car. Like, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, give me give me somebody that knows how to drive the car. And do we really want the driverless car? <laughs> yeah. We kind of want it to know it can do it, but maybe yeah. still have a driver in the yeah. front seat. Yeah, yeah, Is there any technology that uh, is kind of interesting that's coming down the pipeline that you could speak to? You know, I think in our industry, it's, it's really ripe for better operational technology. Maybe yeah. not necessarily in the airplanes, but from, a, from an operator standpoint. And so... Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff right now to, you know, really improve our software platforms and our operations and our optimizers and things like that. But yeah. it could be improved, and but that's more of a, you know, helping the puzzle get put together. Not sure if you know the answer to this, but as it relates to kind of manufacturing of these planes right now, uh, COVID has broken down a lot of supply chains and everything else. Are planes getting built at the same speed that they were? Is there going to be a, a delay in kind of new planes coming out? Or is it kind of business as usual as it relates to maybe the phenom? But if you could speak to others. Yeah, no, from from what I've found from uh, the, the manufacturers is they have slowed production uh, for new airplanes. But, you know, on the flip side of that, we talk to aircraft brokers all the time that are selling used airplanes and they're flying off the shelf. Yeah. And then so we uh, talked to one the other day that, you know, at, at the beginning of COVID, they had 50 airplanes that they were listing that they were working to sell. And and by the time we talked to them, which uh, may have even been a couple months ago, they said they had eight. So, wow. so they're, you know, planes are selling, uh, you know, a lot of people are even migrating from, 
you know, have maybe have chartered to going straight to owning their own airplane. Yep. I think that's a lot to chew off, you know, and yeah. and, and one fell swoop. But but if you can do it and that's what you feel comfortable with and you've got it with the reputable managed operator, then then sure. For sure. Is there anything that stands out to you if I asked you the question of how this industry might look different 10 years from now? I think there'll be a lot of consolidation. There's a, you know, private aviation has been around a while. There's a lot of people running various businesses that's, you know, really been a lifestyle business. Yep. And as the technology continues to improve and the consolidation of program types continue to happen that, you know, I, I think we'll see more consolidation. You know, there's, there's a lot of one-off management companies out there and that may not be able to compete as well as the technology gets better. And, you know, the, you know, the account management platforms that we're working on that our customers have, and, you know, it, it may just become hard to compete because, you know, mass gives you better fuel pricing and everything else. And, you know, and then and I think you'll probably see a push toward maybe electrical, yep. you know, and then so we see a lot of that now and, you know, anything that you can do to save fuel or, you know, be better on the planet would be, would be fantastic. Too. Any planes that are going to be flying in a Tesla battery or is it going to be uh, uh, gas? Or I don't gasoline? know, but it, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what do your gas contracts look like? Do y'all hedge? Do you pre-buy or you just kind of take it at whatever market's at? Uh, no, we, we just negotiate with all the various fuel vendors. There's okay. since we're, since we're flying all over the, all over the country that, you know, there's there's fuel vendors that really touch, you know, just about everywhere you fly. And yeah. so we like to, you know, like anything, consolidate volume and 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 work to get better pricing through that. How much fuel do you all buy a year? I knew you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> uh and, and I and I should know it, but I don't know it off the top of my head. What's a guess? I would say probably three million gallons a year. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go back and they're going to tell me I'm way off. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool to be, yeah. it's okay to be wrong. Yeah. Besides obviously just a plane not crashing, are there any other kind of risks that you look out in the, the industry, whether it's customer risk or plane risk or anything in the industry that kind of keeps you up at night? Oh, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, a lot of it with us is perception. I think people have this perception of private aviation that it's, you know, uber extravagant and it's only luxury and, you know, people shouldn't be doing it with, again, it's for us, it's about productivity. It's about safety. It's, you know, you're on the airplane with anybody you're on the airplane with, you brought on that airplane, right? Uh, it's your, it's your friends and family or your coworkers, colleagues, whatever. And so I think a lot of it just comes down to, to you know, people's comfort. Yeah, yeah for sure. I think Instagram and social media has really pushed that luxury. You get the yeah. people taking pictures. Sometimes I wonder if they're even just driving out to a private airfield just to take a picture oh, next yeah. to a plane oh, yeah. and then heading you, off. You can rent time to take pictures on airplanes. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Do y'all offer that? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, a couple of maybe more personal kind of as it relates to your role. How do you think, like, what is your job as the CEO of a, of a private aviation business? Like, what does your day-to-day kind of look like? What, what are your things that you need to accomplish? Well, the day usually ends up about 10% of what I thought it would end up when I woke up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really all over the place. I'd, we, we've got a lot of great people and, you know, spent a lot of time over the last couple of years really feeling like trying to put the right people in the right places. Yeah. And, and really think that we're there. And now it's, now it's kind of taken, I've always kind of considered myself a fixer and a builder. Yeah. Like I was actually listening to one of your podcasts earlier and, and they were talking about, you know, the difference between somebody that likes startups and somebody that likes, you know, different aspects of it. Like I am not a, I will never create a business yeah. not from scratch. It's just, I know that my brain doesn't work, but I love looking at businesses and saying, Oh, you know, I'd, I'd like to do that different, that different, that different. And so, and so that's where I think, um, you know, coming into my role is it was really from a financial aspect is how do we make this business more efficient, scalable? Yep. And so we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years doing that. And also, you know, maintaining that sense of customer service that really the whole brand was built on. Right. And so, you know, how, how can we make this business bigger and better without sacrificing that, that customer experience? 
And then so that's where we work to consolidate fleet types. But now it's now it's kind of best, you know, fixing is fun, but building is funner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> more fun, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah so funnest. Uh, funnest, yeah. <laughs> um, and so now we've we've gotten to the point where it's like, okay, we've got the business in a scalable mode to where, you know, whether we add managed customers or charter customers or fractional customers and you know a lot of w- one of the other things that we do that that nobody really knows about is we do a lot of uh, maintenance work so yeah. we, we maintain our own airplanes we've got a significant size maintenance staff but we also do a lot of third-party maintenance so we see a lot of benefit in growing that business and when i first came in it was all fractional 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 right well then as we started to, to dissect the business pieces and then really roll them under one umbrella you kind of see that, oh, there's opportunities in every single one of these buckets. Yep. And then so that's that's kind of what we're doing now is, hey, let's attack this as, you know, one air share. We're kind of the full, you know, service private aviation company. And, you know, we can, you know, we don't care where you're at in the life cycle. And, and let's just go, let's just go find customers that that need and want private aviation. And we'll help you through the process of, of where you should be. So now it's just about, you know, getting more customers, uh, and then and then as we build density in the locations we are now, you know, migrate out into into new territories. Were those things obvious to you when you got to the business, or did it take some time to keep digging to find where the sweet spots were? You know, I, so one of the things that as I was coming on board, the ownership group wanted me to do was kind of said, "Hey, here's here's a bunch of information. You know, present us a deck that says what do you think." And yeah. I'm like, I. I, you know, I haven't even stepped in the door. I have no idea, but <laughs> but it was pretty obvious to me that you know we had a lot of airplanes that you probably didn't really need, right? And that create a lot of complexity. Yep. And so that was really job number one: is to hey, let's you know people love these airplanes that that we, that we have now, so why not just you know build a fleet around these particular fleet types. And then again, we can become more efficient, and continue to pass those those costs onto our or cost efficiencies onto our customers. And so now, we've done that, and now it's just a matter of growing the fleet, growing the customer base, and and getting the word out because we know that if we're a part of the conversation when somebody's looking to enter in private aviation, we're confident that that we can win. Yeah, it's yeah. just a matter of you know, getting over the big names that are, that are typically in the industry. Cause who are the big names? Like, oh, you know, net jets, flex jet wheels yeah, up, yeah. um, is, is, is the ones we compete against most wheels up is like the most, they're on every golfer's shirt and yeah. everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Their marketing budget's slightly bigger than yeah. ours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the, you're, you know, with, with wheels up, great company, you're kind of buying into a club with that one. Yep. And then so that, you know, they're, they do the, the, the fun events and, 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 you know, they own some airplanes, but, you know, they do a lot of charter. I mean, they're kind of a, you know, I mean, all the, all those guys are, are great companies. It's just sure. a matter of, is our program best for you? And yeah. we think for a lot of customers it is. And it's just a matter of, you know, educating them on us and, and the programs. I feel like just listening to you, y'all have a really good idea of who your customer is and you're really confident in, uh, in a, in a good way saying no to the wrong customer. Yeah. And just sticking to the people that you yeah. know add a value to the business. Yep, yeah. yeah. we'll tell you. You know that, that if somebody's got a lake house and it's an hour, hour and a half away, and all they're going to do is fly us to the lake, we'll tell them. You know, we'll, we'll, quite honestly, we're not the ones for you. Right. We're we're happy to find you charter options, but if you want to be in a full blown program, that's not the right one. If you're somebody that flies two two and a half hours a day, no matter what, we're we're competitive for sure. And if you're somebody that can really utilize the program as far as maximize, you know, the hours in the day, we encourage interchange between the aircraft. So right. if, if you own an Afinon 100, because that's what works, you know, you're you're a Texas customer that's that's kind of flying around Texas uh, for 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 different things. And then sometimes you need to go up to Colorado, or you need to go, you know, the coast, and then use the Phenom 300 for those. Or you know, we got some people that are Phenom 300 customers that. That hey, if I'm just going to St. Louis and back today or something, okay, well that's a that's a perfect trip for a Phenom 100, and and that trip, you know, our rates on that are fifteen hundred and some dollars an hour. Yep. Uh, and so you can really drive your all in hourly cost. We see people that have come from you know one of the competitors, and they'll save all in you know forty yep. percent on their all in hourly rates because they really know how to pull the levers of the program. Yeah. Yeah. When you buy a fractional ownership and you said you own planes for 15 years, do you own it for 15 years or do you buy it multiple times? 
Uh, so it, so you'll, you'll buy one and then you'll sell fractions into it yep. and then there'll be people that come in and out of that particular airplane. And so if somebody, you know, after, you know, our average age of customers or average tenure of customers is several years. Right. And so say somebody comes out for year 10 because they sold their group of franchises yeah. or whatever. Well then, you know, if we have that share available and it's got enough life left on it before we dispose of that airplane or sell the airplane off. Then we may sell that share to to somebody else, but really it's just kind of you know accumulating customers and, and and all these different and we own a lot of that our, yeah, our yeah. fleet too. So you know part of it is you know we own what we call a, a lot of core because you know you've got to be able to have the capacity to fulfill the customer demand when needed. Yeah, you can't just sell through every single airplane you have. Is that one of like is that one thing that the majority of people do if they've sold a business or come into a certain amount of money, like the plane is one of the first things on their checklist, whether they're buying their own or getting in. That, that's just a pretty common thing once you've hit a certain level. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see that so on the leisure side for sure. On yeah. the business side, it usually stems from a need. Yeah. Uh, leisure side is kind of a want and hey, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm tired of traveling commercially. Business side is like, I, I can't, do my business without this. Right. Yep. So if we, for example, we buy real estate, we start buying more in Houston, yep. more in San Antonio and Austin, rather than sending asset managers and property managers, you know, on commercial flights for the day, yep. it would make sense to get something hit up every city in one day and yep. you're back. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We see that a lot. It's like construction companies, real estate companies. We've got a lot of that too. Yep. All right. Some personal questions. Do you have a morning routine? No, I'm about as anti-routine as you get. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wish I did. I mean, I, I actually got up and ran this morning, which was great. And I tell myself every morning is like, hey, if I could just get up and run, look how great I feel all day long. And the next day, you know, I'll lay there and and, and instead of getting up and running, I'll, I'll read articles for an hour. Yeah. I'll check emails. I'd say, you know, the first thing I probably do every morning is grab my phone, check emails, see what's going on. After that, it's who knows. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's... Even from a workout perspective, sometimes I'll like to do it in the morning. Sometimes I'll like to do it in the evening. Yep. Most of the time, I like to do it not at all. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> most people. Are uh, most, in that yeah. Camp. But uh, no, I'm a, I'm one of those people that you know I almost need change, like crave change. I can't do the same thing every, every day. day. I just yeah, my my mind doesn't work like that too much. Is there any advice you've been given along your journey that sticks with you? Oh, uh, you know, I think never settle. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, and I think that's probably why I hopped around a little bit yep. early on in my career is, is if I'm not, you know, learning and growing, I feel like it's time to do something else. For sure. And so that that's really what led to that kind of jagged path in the beginning is, is, is trying new things. You know, a lot of what I learned several years ago is the value of networking. Yep. You know, before I was you know, I've always been kind of the weird social finance guy. Yeah. But when I left my original CFO role and went into this investment banking type platform, it was it was more a business development type yep. role and really realized like I love I mean, I could have coffees and lunches and coffees and happy hours. Like I just I like loved meeting people and hearing the stories and and so, you know, and then I think that probably the biggest one is just, you know, just be good to people. Yeah, like, yeah. I think it's just, you know, be a good person and, you know, you know, what comes around goes around kind of yep. thing. Yep. Don't do the wrong thing. Don't to get do the wrong a quick thing. buck or something. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I'm bouncing back real quick because there's one note I left off, but you mentioned, you mentioned consolidation in the industry. Do you plan on being a part of that? Not necessarily selling, but per, uh, going after M and A and acquiring. Yep, yep. That's one of the things that that we talk about a lot now yeah. is trying to find the right type of companies in the right places that that fit, you know, what we do. Uh, we don't want to just grow to grow. Yep. Uh, kind of be very strategic about what what the business looks like. How the you know we're huge on you know I think you hear this all the time. It's almost but like culture. Yep. Like everybody we hire is like, you know, first is, okay, are, you know, are they going to fit our culture? And then, okay, now do they have the skills to kind of sure. do it? So, uh, you know, anything that anybody with that we acquire is, you know, I think we'll be, we'll have hopefully those same set of Are there like of hundreds of potential companies, 10,000? Yeah, because, you know, especially, you know, depends on, depends on what space it is. And that's kind of like we, we like our suite of services because from a managed company perspective, there's a lot. There's people doing 
a couple of airplanes to, you know, a hundred airplanes or whatever. And so, and those, those are everywhere. The charter side, you know, a little bit there. Fractional is, is a little tougher, uh, just because there's not a lot of fractional companies out there managed the, the MRO space, the, the, the retail maintenance space is, is a good spot. So really it's kind of, you know, what's nice about us, since we offer all those, we don't have to just kind of narrow our path of, of where we want to go. We can say, you know, in, in 10 years, we don't know which piece of that business will be bigger than the others. It's kind of what will, what will naturally happen. What we do know is that we'll continue to offer those full suite of services because that has become very yeah. beneficial. And I think really sets us uh, apart from all the competition because, you know, there's big companies out there that all they do is managed or all they do is fractions or all they do is charter. Well, that may work for somebody at a certain period of time, but then, like I said earlier, it's, you know, that may not work for you next year. Right. And then so, and, and we've got a lot of customers that utilize probably all the services at once. Yep. So we'll have a managed customer that has a, a fraction for uh, supplemental lift and then may utilize charter for, a, you know, a large airplane that, that we don't have. And then for sure probably uses our, our maintenance services. Yeah, yeah. So it, it works real well. And on the maintenance side, is it is are you just signing like a uh, fix it whenever I have a problem, or is it like a monthly fee that you're just constantly maintaining, or how does maintenance contract even work? Yeah, for us, it's you know usually on a, on our managed side of the house is is we'll just you know we'll we'll keep track of all their maintenance activity and 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 their schedule of maintenance uh, coming up and kind of work with them to to understand hey you got trips here and and we can. It's really the the monitoring of it, and then yeah. also the performing of it. But it's not necessarily, hey, you got to pay us per month, right? Uh, to do it, yeah. Got it. All right, back to personal. Uh, is there any uh, book that you've read, personal or business, that's been uh, good for your life? You know, I I can't say I'm a great book reader. I am, but I because. I think part of that comes to my short attention span. Yeah. Like if you look at my Kindle, there's a lot of 60 to 70% read books in yep. that thing. And 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 because I feel like sometimes you just get the repetition of it. So, but I love articles. I mean, I probably read, you know, I don't know, two to three hours of articles a day. Like yep. that's kind of part of the morning routine or the whoops woke up at 2 a.m. and all right, yeah. can't go to sleep. And so <laughs> let's just let's just read. I read, you know, a lot of articles right before I go to bed. I but if you had a billboard on a major highway in Kansas that you owned and you could put anything on it for people to read, what would you put on the billboard? Oh, wow. Uh, like about myself? Anything. You could put don't settle. You could put anything, a message for the world uh, to read from John Owen. Uh, man, I don't know. I I think, you know, if it's you know, I kind of, I kind of live my life by what you see is what you get. Yeah. Um. I, I, you know, I kind of like the upfront things, even when I'm negotiating things. You know, I probably somewhat can be a bad negotiator because I just kind of like to throw it all on the table. And here we go. Let's find something that works for for the group. And and you know, I'm not going to try to BS you or lie to you. It's just like this is kind of how I've decided to live my life. It's it's an easy way to go to sleep at night. So, you know, I think it's it's just one of those things where. Hey, be a good person, treat people well, and kind of, you know, I love no it. BS. The rest yep. will fall in. What yep. you see is what you get. Okay. What's the best way for people to get in contact with uh, Airshare? Uh, our website's uh, flyairshare.com. Okay. Uh, it'll kind of tell you everything you need to know. And yeah. Cool. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hey everyone, it's Chris here again. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star rating or write a quick review. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next episode. Chris Powers is the founder and CEO of Fort Capital LP. All opinions from Chris and guests of the Fort Podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Fort Capital LP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for real estate or investment decisions. The Fort with Chris Powers is produced by Straight Up Podcasts.